as well as rare edition published works by her and dramatic adaptations of her work. Her typescripts to broadsides, the Judy Rainbow collection of Sylvia Platt significantly and substantively adds to the wealth of Platt materials already held at the college. We also have an exhibit that just went up yesterday that features and focuses on some of the uh, just so this taste of materials from Judy's collection. Thank you, Judy, for this extraordinary gift. First, there will be time for questions um, following the conversation. Uh, I will go on mic and ask people to line up over here. Additionally, Heather will sign books um, that have been given, uh, broadside books this year represented, um, and while you're waiting for your signatures, um, we'll have some light questions as well. So please enjoy. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Heather and Judy in conversation. Hello, everybody, all of you out there. Uh, this is the second time that Heather and I have been in conversation uh, officially about Sylvia Platt. Uh, the first was at the Cosmopolitan Club in New York City. And uh, I want to start off by asking a quest, the same question that I asked the first time, and that is your decision to write this biography since there were so many biographies of Sylvia Plath and articles and books and uh, dissertations. And you said it took you eight years to write it. So I'd like to hear more about that and I'm sure our audience would too. Yes. Um, yeah, before I answer, I just wanted to say thank you, Beth, for that warm introduction. And uh, I'm just so honored to be here at Smith College. I spent a long time doing research um, in the Mortimer Book Room, of course, and thanks to Karen Kukil, who's here tonight. Um, I just, you know, I'm so grateful to Karen for facilitating my research over several years. And, you know, I always feel Sylvia Plath's presence when I'm up here, so I'm just very honored, honored to be here tonight. Um, so, yeah, it took me about, maybe even about 10 years <laughs> from, from the time I signed the contract with Time the book was published. There, I think my biography is the 11th uh, biography of Sylvia Plath. So this was a question that I got all the time, right? Like, why do we need another biography of Sylvia Plath? And I have, I have many reasons actually. <laughs> I think I, as a as a professor, felt through the years that when I taught Plath, I didn't have a great biography to assign my students. Um, and I suppose that in my mind, I had the, the sort of ideal uh, of Hermione Lee. You know, that's, that's who I thought of when I thought of a really good women's biography, the Virginia Woolf biography that she wrote. Um, and I felt like that didn't exist for Platt. And it, it sort of frustrated me that that we didn't, you know, have that <laughs> three-inch sort of Hermione Lee or Linda Warden style biography, kind of a serious, critical biography of her, because I just felt like she was one of the most important writers of the 20th century. And I felt like when I started 10 years ago, I don't know if that's this is still the case now, but there was so much attention paid to the manner in which she died that sometimes it almost eclipsed her trailblazing poetry. So I felt that she'd been pathologized um, in other biographies, and in movies, and television shows, even book reviews. And so I, I felt like, well, I was looking for a third book project and I just decided I was going to throw my hat in the ring and <laughs> try to write this biography. And there was a lot of new material coming out too. Um, the Letters of Sylvia Plath, was going to be published in 2018 and I knew about that. So that made things a lot easier for me. Uh, Ted Hughes's archives uh, had been donated to, or sold I should say, to Emory University and the British Library 
in the early 2000s. And there was still a lot to mine, I thought, in, in Ted Hughes's archives. Um, so, so there were there were new things that you know, new uh, letters and manuscripts and drafts that had not been incorporated into previous biographies, and of course the estate situation had changed. Owen Hughes used to run, well, Ted Hughes ran the plot estate, but Owen was really the uh, gatekeeper there, and that had changed hands, right? So Frida Hughes, uh, Sylvia Class's daughter, and Ted Hughes's daughter is now in charge of the plot estate, and and that was. That was easier uh, for me to deal with. So, so that's sort of a long-winded answer to your question, but it came down to new material um, and just a sense that the time was right for what I hoped was a more scholarly and serious biography of Sylvia Yeah, you, you mentioned her letters, and I think uh, and I would thank Karen Kukiel, who is the co-editor of this two volume edition of uh, every letter that Sylvia Plath wrote uh, that we know about. And uh, it's been a very valuable resource. And, uh, and one of the things that struck me about it, and I'm sure many other people, is that a good percentage of these letters were written to her mother. And that when she was at Smith, for example, she wrote to her mother every day, sometimes more than once a day. And thinking back to those years, uh, I don't remember ever writing a letter to my mother. I think I probably called her collect most of the time. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I just wondered about her relationship with her mother and uh, the fact that she wrote all these letters and also the unfortunate fact that she burned the letters her mother wrote to her after Ted Hughes left her. So maybe you can tell us more about her relationship with Aurelia Plath. Yes, I mean, in a way that was the most complicated relationship for me um, to tackle in the book was this relationship between Plath and her mother. Um, there were previous biographies I felt had maybe focused almost too much on Plath's relationship with her father because of moms like daddy. And that was certainly, it was certainly traumatic you know, that she lost her father at such a young age. But, you know, her mother was the one who was there through her whole life. And her mother had had literary ambitions herself. Um, which I learned more about when I wrote the biography. I don't even know if I realized that when I started. And so um, Plath, I think, and it was a complicated relationship because she obviously felt pressure to achieve, right, from her mother and, and her parents were academics. So you know, she grew up in this very academic Germanic family, very you know, strong work ethic, strong sense of discipline. So there was pressure from her mother uh, which I think you know, sometimes Plath resented, but she also I think, fed off of that, that expectation, the high expectations. Um, and so, and her mother, you know, I think has been sort of maligned um, in terms of... Uh, As many mothers are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of blame has been put, you know, upon Aurelia. And, and I talk in the book about mid-century psychiatry and this blame that there, there was often a blame that was assigned to mothers, right? If something was going wrong with, with the child and, and then Aurelia maybe was a sort of victim of that. Um, but I think she, you know, she, she did push plots to achieve. She was supportive. Um, I, I do have some sympathy for her, you know, quite a lot of sympathy for her. And the letters, I think she was a sounding board. Um, and it's become almost a cliche of Plath criticism to, to say that the letters Plath wrote to her mother were just sort of false. And, you know, they didn't give the truth and they always showed the, the happy side and the cheerful side. And I think there is some truth to that because if you read a letter that Plath wrote to her mother uh, and then you read the, about the same event in her journal, unpublished calendars, there's often a big difference. But I think there's truth in both. Um, I think 
there's truth in both tellings in a sense that, yeah. that there was the good side too. And, that, um, and of course, when she tried to commit suicide while she was still a student at Smith, it was her mother's sleeping pills that she found and uh, used for that uh, unfortunate episode. And her mother had to uh, do what she could to save her life. And uh, so that that is a big part of the book. And that shows up in the bell jar too, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know, the bell jar really was not happy with the, the, the presentation of the mother in the bell jar. Um, but, and I, I think she, that, that character was sort of more of a, co a composite character than maybe we realize. Um, and, you know, Plath was writing fiction, it was autobiographical fiction, but she was writing a novel, it wasn't a, a memoir. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the trauma of losing your husband and then almost losing your daughter. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for what Cornelia Plath went through. And uh, you mentioned her father, and uh, I do remember reading uh, uh, Helen Vendler, the poetry critic, writing that she, uh, she wrote 19 poems about her father. And 24, I know I know that's right, and four elegies. So her father was very much on her mind throughout her life and towards the end of her life, that major poem, Daddy, which has been quoted so many times. So uh, what do we know about that? Uh, what's been said about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, he existed in her imagination, almost. Um, he was someone who had um, come to America with very little English, um, and he was sort of an overachiever like his daughter. <laughs> Went to, and ended up getting a PhD, um, ended up a professor at Boston University. He wrote a book on bumblebees, and, um, I think that in, he existed in class mind as kind of this great, you know, the great man, this uh, hair professor. And he was another presence that, I think there, was some, there were high expectations even in, in her imagination of what her father wanted me to do. So, uh, but I think there was also anger um, because when he died, he had refused to see a doctor for a long time and it turned out that, so he died from complications of diabetes um, when she was eight. And it, if he had seen a doctor earlier, he perhaps could have been saved, but he had this kind of fatalism um, about him. Like, I'm, uh, I'm dying, you know, I'm not gonna see a doctor. And, and I think uh, she, she resented that. And that's sort of what I read when I read Daddy part of that, that intense anger of the poem. I mean, it's, it's also been a poem that's been co-opted by the women's movement um, as well. Yes. Um, anger towards patriarchy, but I, there's that sort of anger at losing him at such an early age when maybe she didn't want to. I mean, her father, her father uh, writing about her father, feminists felt that he was, uh, uh, Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. Like, I, I feel like that almost became a catchphrase of the women's movement. That poem was so important, I think, for second wave feminism. And you see Plath almost introducing female anger into the poetic lexicon. It was so cathartic, uh, a poem like that. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think you know, that poem functions on a sort of personal level, but also transcends the personal, which so many of Plath's poems do. Yeah. So let's uh, maybe talk a little about uh, her marriage to Ted Hughes and uh, the fact that they barely knew each other. They only known each other for four months when they, uh, she proposed marriage to him. And, uh, and they got married on Bloomstead. They did. 
Yes, and uh, her mother was the only witness to this work. And uh, so let's talk a little about her relationship with Tim Hughes and how that affected her uh, professional career as a, as a poet. Well, that was the other really tough relationship to take on in this book, as you can imagine. <laughs> and that's part of why I think the book is uh, so long, uh, because I felt like I had to give a lot of detail also about Ted Hughes, about the marriage, their relationship, because um, you know, Ted Hughes is a major poet as well, a major 20th century poet. And, um, and I had actually written, my, my second book was about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes and their poetic relationship. It was an academic book. Uh, but I, I had been fascinated by that relationship and the fact that here are these two, two young poets who wanted to take on the world, right? They wanted to, to shock British poetry out of submission when they meet in 19, February of, of 1956. And uh, you know, there's just so much ambition in, in the both of them. And so uh, I spent my second book sort of just trying to figure out how they had influenced each other and how, how Plath had influenced his poems and vice versa. I think most people know that Plath was his secretary, basically, and his, his agent. Um, he later wrote that, uh, he may not have ever become a poet, or a recognized poet, I should say, if not for her. I think in one of the birthday letters poems, he says something like, I'd be fishing off a rock in Western Australia, you know, if not for her. So I think there was a late, a late recognition from him of everything that she did for him, because when they met, he was a very minor poet. He had published a few things in Cambridge uh, literary magazines, uh, he was young. He was young, right. He had just graduated uh, a couple years ago and he used a pseudonym as well for some of these, um, some of these poems. So when she met him, uh, they were launching a magazine called the St. Botolf's Review. He and a few other poets, um, young poets, they wanted to shake things up. They were disillusioned by style of poetry. That was, and this was at Cambridge. This was at Cambridge, yeah. Disillusioned by sort of uh, movement style poetry, which they thought was too safe, you know, uh, too kind of precious or uh, literary. They wanted to write like Yeats and Dylan Thomas and D.H. Lawrence. And, and they wanted to kind of write in this really bold, raw, more honest way. And, uh, and so that was thinking behind this magazine, right? The St. Baltus Review. So Sylvia Plath met Ted Hughes at the launch party for this magazine. And it's, it's sort of become the most famous date in literary yeah. history. <laughs> she bit his cheek and, uh, and drew blood. And, you know, it was, it was sort of all a big performance. And she writes this operatic journal passage about him after the meeting. Um, how they were, they were shouting at each other in the high wind. And I mean, it's like they're on the moors in King Lear or something, you know, it's like, it's just incredible. And, and from that time, I think um, she, she had her sights set on him. And she, you know, she is someone who, she had dated these American men, right? Um, who were sort of the ideal, like Aurelia's ideal, these all, all American men. Um, they were going to become doctors. And, uh, and, and Sylvia just, I think, realized that she, they weren't necessarily going to support her, her own literary ambition, that she needed to find a partner who would do that. Um, and I think that, that wasn't easy for her in 1950s America. You know, she had this really strong ambition to become a great poet, even, as, even from the time she was a child. And so finding that man, right, finding that partner, that takes up a lot of space in the journals and who's going to, to support me and my, my vocation and who's not going to dismiss that sense of vocation that I have. And in the bell jar, Buddy Willard compares writing poems to, to dust or something. So, you know, he, he's very condescending towards Esther's ambition as a writer. So when she meets Ted Hughes, she sort of feels like, okay, 
here he is. And, and he was handsome. And he was very, very <coughs> handsome. I mean, by all accounts, magnetic. And he recognized, I mean, I, I know, I understand there's a lot of controversy about Ted Hughes, but he did, I think he did recognize her genius um, very early on and, and they split their time, right? So uh, she would often write in the morning, this was after their marriage, and then he would write in the afternoon and they would split the childcare. Um, and, I, and I think that was unusual at that time, at least the, the women that I talked to who had known Plath, and they all brought that up, like the ones who had known Plath and he was in England as being, like, that's just something that didn't happen in, in 1960. <laughs> and, and they remember Ted pushing the pram and they, they all just, <laughs> men didn't push prams um, through, through the park at that time. So that, that came up in the interviews I did, you know, that just sort of sharing the childcare and sharing that domestic load. Uh, of course she did more of it, I'm not saying that it was 50-50, but I think it was unusual at the time. Um, of course, the marriage ended terribly. It just completely devolved. Um, but for a time, you know, in those early years, there were, they supported each other and they, they wrote some really good poetry. I mean, Hawk in the Rain came out in 1957. Well, and I, I recall reading how he would, if she had writer's block, he would give her ideas to, uh, to base her poetry on. Yeah, yeah, he would, um, especially- so They were sort of a team. Yeah, and they had the same sort of, I think, aesthetic um, <coughs> sensibility, you know, just they, they wanted to write these poems that would, would shake things up, that, that came from a bolder place. Um, and they really situated themselves against uh, the movement, which was the, the poetry that kind of dominated British journals at the time. So they, they wanted to come in and kind of smash things up. And, and Plath actually, for, for a while had wanted, she felt like she was writing in a way that was, um, she called it too precious. And she felt like, uh, as she put it, I need to break through the glass call, C-A-U-L. Like I, I need to break out of this, this kind of literary style, this mannered style that I'm writing in, this more you know, very formal, technically perfect style, but maybe- T.S. Eliot. Yeah, she wanted a little bit more, um, a little bit more blood in there, as you, you know, said. So that was what they were striving for, was to uh, kind of go beyond the well-made poem, the well-mannered poem. And I think that he actually helped her do that. He sort of, in a way, gave her permission to do that. Because remember, she's a woman poet. And one thing she does not want to be, she does not want to become what they call lady poets, right? She doesn't want to write in this very decorous way that, that's pleasing to everyone. She, she, does, she feels like that's not authentic. So Hughes helps her, uh, I think, find that new style, the new style we see in Eric. Um, I think he, in a way, just helped give her permission. And so did Robert Lowell, I think, too. But she took Robert Lowell's class. So, and then what happened? What happened? <laughs> well, so they they um, Plath and Hughes, of course, Plath taught here at Smith College in uh, 57, 58, and then they moved to Boston. She only taught here for one year. She was she was supposed to teach for two. Well, she was sort of understood that she was going to teach for two years, and then after a semester, she just decided it was too. Uh, taking too much of a toll, I think, on her creative self. And Ted Hughes was teaching at UMass Amherst and he was, he enjoyed teaching there, but he had the same sense that, um, what did he say? Teaching leads to the death of the imagination. You know, that kind of <laughs> thing. So he, he did not want to teach another year. And you know, to what extent he talked Plath out of staying here, that's up for debate, but he certainly didn't want to. Um, so she, was, she gave her resignation um, halfway through the year. It was not taken kindly. Um, and anyway, they moved to Boston the next year to try to make it as freelance writers. They moved to Beacon Hill. And she took a class with Robert Lowell. She took a poetry class at Boston University and that's where she met Anne Sexton. Anne Sexton was in the same class. And life studies 
would be published that April of 59. So, you know, imagine being in a class with Robert Lowell as Life Studies is about to come out and Sexton as she's writing to Bedlam and Partway Back and they're all workshopping these poems. So it's just such a heady atmosphere in that seminar room. And I, I think Plath was enormously influenced by Sexton and Lowell and because they're writing about these things that had been taboo, right? There's their time in mental hospitals, their experience with depression, suicide attempts. I mean, all of the stuff that, that she had written prose about, but she hadn't written poetry about up until you know, that time. And again, I think they sort of gave her permission to explore all of that in her work because she saw Lowell doing it. And at that time, Robert Lowell was one of the most important American poets. Yes, you know, so maybe say something about the confessional. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he won a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, he, so he was the sort of idea that if he's doing it, right, um, this is uh, something, something to watch. And Sexton as well is delving into um, these very personal experiences. And I think, so Plath starts writing more personal poems in that class, you know, we're not, we're not an area yet, but she begins to write uh, poems that have suicide as in their, um, as a theme, uh, that sort of thing. And, or, you know, going to her father's grave. And in 1959, the critic M.L. Rosenthal publishes a review of life studies and he kind of coins the term confession poetry um, in the nation in 1959. So that, that term then is applied to Sexton Lowell uh, for many years. And to what extent, you know, it's an accurate term. We can talk about that for a long time. I have concerns that it, it can put, you know, that term puts class poems into a box in which people sort of only read them autobiographically when she was this enormously learned poet who's always alluding to other, other poets, right? Um, you know, whether it's D.H. Lawrence or Shakespeare or um, Sarah Teasdale. Edith Sitwell. Yeah, Edith Sitwell, right. I mean, she, her poems are so literary, actually, right? So she's actually a very modernist writer. So they're, they're personal, but they're also finely crafted and, and elusive in really sophisticated ways. Um, so sometimes the confessional term doesn't really, I think, bring that to light in the way that it should. But you know, when I was researching uh, this, I ran across an interview that M.L. Rosenthal had given to Harriet Rosenstein, who, who was somebody who started a Plath biography in the 1970s, but she never finished it. Um, she ended up do uh, selling her papers to Emory University, and she had interviewed scores of people in the early 70s when everyone's memory was fresh. So this was a treasure trove of material and I, <laughs> I got to, to look into it two months before you know the book came out. So Knopf let me, let me add material at the last minute. But one of the things I remember from the Harry Rosenstein paper, she interviewed M.L. Rosenthal and he remembered a dinner party where, where he met Plath in London and he asked her about this term, confessionalism. And, and she told him that she, it, it had to transcend the personal. It could be personal, but it, it, it had to transcend. So, so that's what Plath thought about it. Um, and I thought it was extraordinary, yeah, extraordinary to eavesdrop you know, on this conversation that Sylvia Plath had had with Rosenthal um, so long ago about this term that would come to sort of define her poetry. I knew him as Mac Rosenthal. He was a colleague of my husband. Oh, was he? Okay. <laughs> so that was one of those moments in the archive when you just sort of think, oh my God. Um, yeah, just to, as I said, to eavesdrop in a way. And then uh, when they went back to uh, England after their year in Boston and traveling, uh, and she was, became pregnant with her first child, Frida. And then life changed again, as it does for all of us when we are. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we give birth to children. Yes. 
And uh, so uh, maybe talk a little about how this was a big adjustment for them, bigger than they had thought. Y yes, I think, isn't it always, right? <laughs> it's bigger than you think. Um, she had talked a lot about wanting to have children, right? All the time, it's a theme in her journals and although she's, she's nervous about it, um, she hopes at times that she will have published quite a bit before she has children. And so it's something that causes her anxiety, but at the same time, it's something she wants. So um, she, for a while, she thinks she can't get pregnant. And th this was a source of, of great terror for her. Um, she, she writes about it in her journal. She just can't, you know, she says things like, I'd rather die, you know, than not have children. So um, luckily, false alarm. And um, I think having Frida was, it was a wonderful thing. Um, it helped bring them even closer, I think, Platt and, and Hughes. They doted on her. I mean, they they wrote poems about her. I think it was it was okay. I think it was the second child actually. It was Nicholas that made things um, more complicated because then Plath had a toddler and an infant, and she was breastfeeding, um, and she was getting no sleep. And uh, it, I think it, I think the the second child sort of helped push things over the edge a bit. And that's the sense you get reading the journals in, in, um, in Devon, in North Taunton. And, um, and then of course she didn't have as much time to write because she's taking care of two children. Uh, and I think- and by then they had moved. Yes, they had moved to Devon. Um, and they were isolated in Devon. Ted said he wanted to move there um, because you know, he talked a lot about hating London and the rat race and sort of literary life in London. And, oh, it's so pretentious and this and that. Um, and he loved nature, obviously. He loved to fish. Um, Plath had wanted to buy a townhouse in London in their own, in their neighborhood um, around Chalcott Square in Camden. She was always, you know, on the hunt. She was always going to look at these um, townhouses and trying to kind of cobble ways to, to purchase one, you know, whether it was borrowing money from her mother or her family members. And um, I, I find, I think she really wanted to stay in London, but they couldn't afford it. Even, even then they couldn't afford it. They could afford a big house out in debt. And so I think that's, you know, that's what Hughes wanted to do. Um, I think she was on board as well because they had always wanted a big house. They had been in these very small spaces their whole life. Like people I interviewed always said that that was something that made an impression on them. But when they would go visit Plath and Hughes in these small apartments, they said Ted Hughes was always like hunching over practically, and, and Plath too was quite tall. So, so they always seemed too small or too too big for these small spaces. So in Devon, they were able to spread out, and they each had their own study, which I think is very important. You know they. They were writing in, in the living room and, and in other apartments. They didn't have their own space. So that was very helpful. But as I say, it was isolated, um, you know, four hours to London or something like that on the train. And, um, and I think maybe that wasn't so great for them. Um, they didn't have a big social life in Devon or at least she did. She really made an effort to meet other women in the village, but of course she's an American and it's a small, small village in rural England and it's not that easy to make inroads. Um, so the isolation wasn't, wasn't good, I think. And then <laughs> Asia comes on the scene. Asia, yes, Asia Webel um, was somebody who, they, they had known briefly in London, they rented out their apartment, they sublet their apartment to Asia and her husband, David Webel, who was a Canadian poet. And, and they got on with them um, when they met them in London. And, and then they invited them down to visit them in Devon. Um, and that's sort of the weekend that Hughes and Asia kind of fell, fell in 
love and everything started to, to fall apart. And so um, he ended up leaving Plath. Um, the marriage devolved. Uh, she moved, she ended up moving back to London in December of 62. Um, he left Court Green in October of 62. And then she wrote, there was like this, this great outpouring of poems in October, November, um, after Ted leaves. And I think she was sort of riding this creative wave um, that was fueled by anger and, and heartbreak too. But it was, it was an extremely productive time for her actually after Ted left. Yeah, yeah. could you uh, give us one of the poems maybe? Um, from memory, no. <laughs> I need to read but how about yeah. even a few well, lines you know, the, writing into yeah. the... One of my favorite, one of my favorite plot poems is The Moon and the Yew Tree. Um, and she wrote this, this is one of the earlier poems that she wrote in Devon um, when they moved there in the fall of 1961. Um, and there was a, the, the house was next to a graveyard um, in a church. And so this poem was sort of based on Plath's uh, view out of her window. And um, I think it was an exercise that Hughes gave her, one of those exercises. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, she couldn't sleep. And so why don't you try to write a poem? And I love this, the, the first line of this poem. This is the light of the mind, cold and planetary. Um, I'll just never get over that line. I mean. The, the strangeness of it and the, the surrealism um, and, and the rhythm, uh, I think it's, it's beautiful. And I actually wanted to title my book, The Light of the Mind. And I know you titled your exhibit. <laughs> yes, my exhibition yeah, was yeah. The Light of the Mind. Yeah, so we, we both have a fondness for that line, I think. Uh, but my editor did not, did not want me to use that line because apparently it, wasn't, it was just too, too long or you know, it wasn't bold enough. Um, but <laughs> But I really wanted to, in first eight years, that was the title of the book, The Light of the Mind. Um, and I liked that, that it had the word light and mind in it because I thought, I thought that those were themes in my book that I wanted to bring out about Sylvia Plath, right? The, this idea of light instead of darkness, which she'd so often been associated with. And this idea of um, brilliance, uh, intelligence that she was, she was one of the most, you know, she's a star student of the Smith English department. She's one of the most brilliant critics um, of her generation. Um, and, and sometimes I think that that fact is, you know, that fact gets kind of lost. So, so that line, that first line of the moon in the yew tree means a lot to me. I think the class poems about depression are some of the most beautiful in the English language. Um, I love Sheep and Fog as well. Um, and and I, I think that she was very brave to write those poems, um, poems like The Moon and the Yew Tree and Elm and, and Sheep and Fog and Edge. And, um, you know, I've had people ask me, well, aren't those dangerous poems? Like, should we be reading or should we be assigning those poems to students? And, and um, really? yeah, 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 and even the bell jar, um, you know, he says too, too dangerous a book, but I, I just, I think she was very brave to kind of, you know, she was able to go down into those depths and, and come back up and report back in a way that was so lucid and, and beautiful and, and strange and surreal, but I think it's actually, actually offers hope um, and solace. So I, I wouldn't see those poems as, as dangerous. Um, but yeah, I, I've been asked that many times. Um, well, there were many happy poems. There so. were, yes, yes. And uh, uh, one uh, autograph that I bought uh, at auction uh, shows uh, Ted Hughes uh, giving the list in order of the poems that will appear in Ariel. And these are not 
the poems that she left for him when she assembled the manuscript and left it in a spring binder on her desk that she committed suicide. And uh, I don't think we really knew that this was the case until her daughter revealed it in a book called The Restored Poems of, uh, I don't remember the exact title, but she called it the restored edition of Ariel. I think that's Bazin. And uh, she, uh, in it, she shows how uh, he really changed in many ways the mood of, uh, of the sequence of the poems. And uh, he's of course been criticized for that posthumously, but posthumously, but maybe you could say something about that. Yes, yeah, it, I mean, so Marjorie Perloff was the first to note this, and she, she wrote an article. Um, oh. Yeah, the two, I think it was the two aerials, I can't remember the exact title of the article. Um, so, yes, that did not endear Ted Hughes, um, you know, to, no. to, especially feminist critics. Um, I don't mean to, to laugh about it, I don't mean to make light of it. Um, but, but yeah, he, he changed the order around. And the original Ariel, the first word was um, love. The first poem was going to be morning song. Love set you going like a fat gold watch. And the last word in class version was going to be spring <clears throat> um, from her poem Winter. The bees are flying, they taste the spring. So there was this hopeful trajectory in her version of the Mary that she left in, in her bedroom study um, when she died. And, you know, rebirth was a huge, is, I should say, a huge theme in class work, rebirth and transcendence. Um, and so clearly she had a specific um, order in mind. And I think she had those themes in mind as well. So Hughes, in his version of Ariel, it ends with, with the darker poems. Uh, it ends with edge and words. And so the he, he sort of shifted the trajectory and into this had the more teleological sensibility that she was heading heading towards suicide, um, <clears throat> and and that of course had a huge impact on Plath's legacy. I think as as this poet this, who's often this associated. This was the book she said that would make her represent. Yes, this was in, when she was writing the aerial poem. She wrote home to her mother. Uh, I'm a genius of a poet. These, these poems will make my name. She knew, she knew. And, um, and so for Ted to alter that um, it was, was really a tragedy um, in, so, in many ways, because yeah, I think that, that did help solidify this kind of pathology that became associated with Plath. Um, poet of darkness, poet of death, poet of, and, and that, uh, that version of Ariel, if you if you read it, you can see why. And but you know, to Hughes also added several poems that he thought would make it better. Um, That's right. She left yeah. several on the yes. on the side that she hadn't put in the book. She did. Yeah, she <laughs> had she had a, a few new poems, and so he sort of he put some of these poems in his version of Ariel, and and I think you know that. Didn't I thought he was improving it. Yeah, he thought he, he thought he was improving it. I mean, I think he really ended up regretting what he did, um, but it was a huge controversy, uh, as you can imagine, and it it made it made life very hard for Ted Hughes in this country. He stopped coming to America to give readings because people would show up at his readings with signs, you know, you murdered Sylvia Plath, and of course there's Robin Morgan's famous poem accusing him of murdering Sylvia Plath. And his, his last name is constantly getting chiseled off of her gravestone. In England, I was just there last week for the Sylvia Plath Festival. Um, her grave says Sylvia Plath Hughes. She's buried in Hepton Stall in West Yorkshire. And so there's no, the Hughes has been stripped off. When I was up there last week, the Hughes have been taken off again. So this is something that's, that goes on almost on a monthly basis, I, I feel like. Um, 
So, but, but the restored Ariel was published uh, it, by, and Frida Hughes was, she, she sort of made it happen. And so we, we now have class version of Ariel. And she did write a very long introduction explaining all of this too. It's quite interesting to read. And I was very excited <laughs> to get this. Yeah. And it was just on um, thin blue paper that we used to use that onion skin paper. And it was uh, an attachment to a letter to his publisher. You know, this is, this is the order of the poems. And uh, uh, did he write about that in birthday letters? Um, if you could say something about birthday letters. Yeah, birthday letters was published in, I think it was 1998. Um, and over 25 years or so, Ted Hughes had written these epistolary poems to Sylvia Plath. Um, and in fact, there are many more of them in the British Library that, that haven't been published and, and written in that style. So there are more, but they are sort of reconsiderations. Um, he writes about certain moments in their lives and it was a huge success. I mean, it was one of the, yeah. so it was a runaway bestseller. And, um, but he was also criticized for kind of alighting his own role in birthday letters. It's, a lot of those poems um, have, there's this sense that everything was faded. Everything was, was going to happen because it was fate. And Ted Hughes is someone who believed in the occult and astrology. astrology and he uh, looked up her signs. Yes. She saw, wrote yes. his sister. Absolutely. And he was very serious about it. I mean, it wasn't just um, a joke. And he was so, so I think part of him really believed that this was all fated to happen, but he was, he was criticized um, for that kind of attitude. But I mean, some of the poems are quite, quite beautiful. There's one um, called Daffodils where he just, he writes about Plath picking daffodils at Court Green with her children. And it's just, it's a gorgeous poem. I'm afraid we have to end our discussion now. And I'm really uh, delighted to have had this conversation with you again. Me too. And, uh, <laughs> I'm always learning something when we speak. And- uh, Well, you knew Sylvia Plath, so. <laughs> yes, I didn't know her well. I was a competitor of hers for the uh, guest editorship. Uh. Uh, that would have been faithful to her, but we all knew she was going to be the winner. And, uh, but anyway, it was an interesting experience. Uh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> you know, and uh, so thank you very much, you, Heather, Judy. for uh, all of your contributions. And for, uh, and I know you're now working on a biography of Anne Sexton. Anne Sexton so. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about her. We are. <laughs> sure. Probably won't be a thousand pages, but. Um, I guess <laughs> we want time for questions. Yeah. Too. Sure. I'd like to say thank you. So, Gracious, what is the from one of our participants on the Zoom webinar today. And Judith, this is for you specifically. Can you take your mask off? Oh, sure. Can you please let us know what your motivation was in collecting Sylvia Black? And what is a favorite item you've owned? And what is something that got away? What is what? What is one that got away in your collecting? Oh, well, uh, I guess one of my favorite poems is Morning Song. Love sets you going like a fat gold watch. Uh, and this was written to her daughter as a baby. And uh, I always like that poem. It's cheerful and it's, um, it says a lot. And my motivation was my husband was a collector of Jeffrey Chaucer and I also gave that collection Smith 
they have that collection too, and that's much bigger than my collection. But uh, we spent a lot of time in London. He would do research at the British Library, and we would go around. There were a lot of, in the 80s, there were a number of used bookstores, secondhand bookstores, and that was an, an, an activity of ours was to walk around and he would say any Chaucer and I would say any Plot. <laughs> and, uh, and then I found her, her work was, was inexpensive at the time and it was available. And there were many book fairs. The, the Hotel Russell used to have a book fair. So most of this was bought in England and some of it was bought at auction. And after the internet, um, one could uh, bid from one's home. <laughs> and uh, Obanum's uh, uh, Frida has given uh, a large number of uh, items to uh, Bonhams and they've held many sales. So that's and, um, my motivation. And, and, and it just, as I began to know her better, you know, I didn't really know her well, but as I began to read her uh, everything and, and know her better, uh, I, I thought, well, this is really something that resonates with me. I was uh, a young mother of 21 <laughs> in uh, 1954. And, uh, and then I had my first child who's here today. I'm 55, so um, so I could I could identify with what she was going through and what, it, and then I started to think about what it was like in the mid 20th century, and I started reading books about uh, life in the 50s, and of course as a professor I was well acquainted with what was happening in education at that time, but um, uh, that's the origin of it. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the theme of motherhood in Plast Poems and how that resonated with you because yes, that, that really resonated with me too. Um, because I, I feel like, you know, well, Anne Stevenson called Plath the first great, one of the first great poets of childbirth in the language. And she was really a pioneer writing about motherhood. That's right. And she really, and miscarriage as well, you know. That poem, Parliament Hill Fields. Oh, that's Three Women. Three which, Women, yeah. Which Ms. Magazine, uh, if you look at the exhibition, that issue is there, that was the preview issue of Ms. Magazine. And by then, and, and I became very active in the feminist movement in 1970. And uh, so she was one of our icons. And, uh, and so we had conversations about her work. And other and other and I met I met women writers a lot of women writers. I when I read three women, there are three women in this uh, in this work. It's sort of a verse play that she she read on the BBC. There's a a mother who uh, a student mother who gives up her baby for adoption, a mother who has a miscarriage, and a mother who has a healthy healthy baby. But that work still seems almost radical to me. Like she does not sanitize or sentimentalize motherhood in a way that is you see all the time and it's just so refreshing to read that and it's, like i said i think she's a pioneer of the poetry of motherhood and that always resonated with me i had two my, my kids were quite young while i was writing this biography and and reading about Plath waking up at four in the morning to write before her children woke up that that made me get up in the morning as well because i just thought She's amazing, you know, she's, she's able to write Ariel with two toddlers on her foot and I, I just found that so inspiring as a mother struggling to find time to write myself. So I'd have these meta moments and just appreciate so much what she was able to do. Just not, not just writing poems about motherhood, but being a mother and, and continuing to write in this culture that did not support writing mothers. That's right. So and when I, when I went back for my doctorate, you know, that was an unusual thing to do. Uh, and uh, uh, I had been on the school board for nine years and that was fine, you know, you were a volunteer. But then when you decided, well, you want a career, that was something different. Not anymore. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, um, my name is Amalia. I'm a writer for the Sylvain newspaper. Um, so my question for you is, what do you think, for either or all, um, what do you think the relevance, uh, Sylvia class relevance is to the modern Smithy? To the modern Smithy. Yeah, that's a, to, what's her relevance to the modern Smithy? Yeah, well, I can I can take a step as far as I'm going to I think I think that her her work um, it it addresses things that we're still dealing with. I mean, especially the bell jar. You've got um, men behaving badly. You've got um, the, this this goal of self actualization. You've got rebellion against these horrific beauty standards. Um, you've, you've got um, depression, heartbreak, all of those things are still very relevant. Um, and then, you know, her, I just think she still speaks truth to power in, in these poems. Um, there's a rawness and an honesty there um, and, and the strangeness, which I think makes her poetry so original, you know, so singular and compelling. This, this crystalline voice, the control, the authority, the grandeur of it, um, and often this, this sort of undertone of surrealism. You know a Sylvia Plath poem when you read one, right? It's, and how many poets can, can say that? If she's just, she's got such a singular voice. But, but I, I think, yeah, I think she speaks to things that are still um, going on in women's lives. You know, she, she tried to tell the truth about women's lives at a time when that was a difficult thing to do. And I, I think that's a big part of her legacy. And, yeah, and I think yeah. the whole abortion controversy now shows us that not a lot has changed so far as many men are concerned yeah. as to what the role of women should be. And uh, I think we have to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and just reading reading Parliament Hill Fields out loud on the BBC in 1961, a poem about miscarriage. Um, I think that was a really significant thing that she did. Uh, and she she gives it an introduction and, and she says it's about miscarriage, you know, more or less. And she doesn't try to hide it. This was a time when you could barely say the word pregnant. <laughs> Never, none, you know, not. So uh, yeah, I think she's still teaching these things. Hello, I was wondering if you might share a little bit about um, Plath's writing process um, and also her process of revision, like how many times she went over her pieces. Well, I feel like Amanda Golden and Karen Kukil should answer this question. They're in the audience. <laughs> um, they're putting together um, an a new edition of Class Poems, which is going to be, oh my God, so phenomenal. Um, I, I wish I'd been able to write this biography using using their, the new edition. It's so meticulously done, and it's just going to change class studies forever. Um, so, so I feel a little intimidated answering that question in their presence. You know, one thing about collected poems is the current edition, which is the one that won a Pulitzer Prize in 1982. Uh, anything that was was put together by Hughes after she died under pressure from people who said they weren't publishing enough of her poems. And what he did was anything she wrote before they were married in 1956 is in the back of the book as juvenilia. And so that's how he looked on her and looked on her work that anything that mattered that made any difference was when they were Oh. Yeah, and I guess when, you know, she loved that the Smith Memorandum paper, you know, she wrote a lot of the Aaron King song, um, <laughs> that, that iconic Smith paper. Um, I guess just generally speaking, I think sometimes because Plath is labeled this confessional poet, there's a sense that there was this oracular force moving through her and that she just wrote, right? But it's not true, she drafted a lot. Um, you know, some poems less than others, but she definitely went through drafts and the drafts of Ariel are here at Smith College and you can, you can see exactly what she did. I mean, they're, it's incredible to have those 
over there in the library. <laughs> Go check them out. Well, I know there are many poetry events and poetry events. So we'll end there in favor, I guess, what's worth for me in conversation with us. Thank you.